glad to have you on. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. Tell me a little bit about um, about uh, a book that you're working on now or your most recent work. What inspires you to write? I write cozy mysteries. It's a okay. subgenre from mysteries. It's mm -hmm. a lot more. It's kind of like think about murder. She wrote okay. kind of book series. Um, I'm working on the second book in my um, messy bookshop mysteries. Okay. Okay. A binding chance, correct? Yes, by any chance. Perfect, perfect. Do you want to tell the, the viewers a little bit about what that's about without giving too much away? <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> right. Uh, basically, it's kind of like a book uh, an em bookstore employee. Um, she's getting ready to meet her new boss because her previous boss passed away. And when she meets her new boss, she... Um, Things kind of get off on the wrong foot between her and a new boss. And okay. by the end of the first chapter, they find a person dead in the bookstore. So they have to save the bookstore from going under as well as clear her boss's name. Right. OK. All right. That sounds pretty cool. Tell me how you go about character development. Oh, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like one of my hardest things because I try to make every character different. OK. So, Cozy Mysteries is more about a community, kind of like everyone likes each other. I mean, there's a murder, which, you know, it's a bummer, right. but it's still a good town. It's still all happy and stuff. So I try okay. to write characters that I would like to hang out with and just okay. have fun with it. And with your characters, do you like, do you, do you go in depth with them? Do you, do you leave some of them brief? Do you, is it kind of a mix up there? How do you go about that? Um, I try to have her, like, my main character's main, like, her closest people to her, like, her family, some of her best friends. Um, okay. But there's a few, like, side characters that's just, you know, side characters. Right. Okay. All right. What about setting? Do you get very descriptive with your setting, and do you kind of leave that that in the background a little bit? Um, setting in a cozy mystery world you want your reader to wish they could visit that place. Even if it's a fictional town, you wish it existed. Um, right. For my setting with the Binding Chance, I kind of use, I'm from Tennessee, so I use a Tennessee setting, kind of like what I like about it, small town, happy vibes. Okay, okay. All right, uh, tell me something that you've learned since you started writing that, that you could tell the viewers that you wish you knew like, hey, do this, don't do that. I always ask this question because everybody has a different perspective of this. Um, this is kind of a self-learned one. Um, whenever I was, because I wanted to write since I was a kid. I was a kid in school who wrote and not do her schoolwork. <laughs> Bad right. thing. That's not my advice, though. <laughs> Same here, but all right. Um, so I was told by a lovely teacher that after she read one of my stories that write as a hobby, leave the writing to a professional. And that really destroyed me for the longest time. And then it took many years later, like I was after college. I think I had my first so daughter. So basically criticizing your writing, you're saying? Yes, it was bad. My edit, I was not very good with grammar as a kid. And oh. it was just ripped apart. So after I wrote for fun, you know, yeah. so after I did that, I kind of realized that I do have a talent. It's like there's going to be two types of criticism. One obviously doesn't help you, and the other is to improve you. Obviously, right. my teacher was not the improving part. Well, of course. So I You're think that get people really like helped. that. Because it helps. Because our writing is, there's always people who's going to criticize it, not just the writing world, but I feel like almost any career, especially arts. There's always criticism. There's always that. Yeah, that. everybody has a different perspective, right? Yes. Okay. Do you ever get writer's block? And if you do, how do you how do you handle it? How do you get over yeah. that? I do one or two things. Mostly, I write. I listen to music. I listen to like different types of music. Okay. But the main thing, which is very distracting, but it totally helps me though. I play this will never happen game. Basically, okay. like this will never happen to my character, which you want some tension and some drama, but there's clearly some things that will never happen and you know it, but it's fun to play the game. Like, right. for okay. example, um, 
in this book that I'm working on, I have my characters, they learned about the murder that happened at their bookstore versus they found it, like how they did in the first book. Oh, and okay. it's like, so it's like, great, they discovered it. Now what? Now what? Right. <laughs> so I played a bunch of what if games to like, well, this will never happen. They won't just go up to police and be like, I demand to know or just go to sleep or drive. It's like, okay. so it got led me to how bad a suspect to it and, you know, follow them. <laughs> okay. So okay. it's fun to play the what if game or this would never happen game, I should say. It definitely, definitely sounds like a cool angle to try for sure. It's fun. Right. A little distracting, okay. but it, it definitely gets you out of the writer's block, not knowing what not to write about will help you lead what to write about. Okay. Okay. That makes like sense. It, like I said, that, that's a really good angle to because nobody's ever gave me that perspective of what not to write about. They always try to embellish on what to write about. So that, that's actually really decent. Um, what's the hardest thing for you to, to do with writing? What's the hardest thing for you about it? Is it the time of day? Is it the setting? Is it your characters? What, what really pulls on you? I write during school hours because that's where my kids are at school. So okay. I kind of I have that down for the most part. I can't write at night though. A miles will just put it aside. But as far <laughs> as what's the hardest to write is the rough draft. Like it okay. is hard writing the rough draft and making sure. Do you do an outline or no? Oh yes, I, I'm an outline freak. I will write. And what's the reason for that? I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. this is good information I'm trying to pull out of here for the viewers and for yourself and for myself. What's the reason for the outline? I am definitely a planner. After writing, I think my first four books, I was, you know, a hobby. I kind of yeah. discovered I do better if I know where I'm going, because otherwise I'll just drum on the keys and I'll do nothing. Right. <laughs> so okay. and that one helps me out. I can see where I need to go. It doesn't stay in stone. Like I don't, it's not like this is what my outline is. I have to stick with it. I change right. it as I go, but I can at least have a direction. I can see I need to add a clue here. I need to move on from this story or crap. I repeated that storyline three times already. So it just kind of helps me okay. organize it. All right. All right. With organization, let's go into chapter length then. How do you approach that? How do you know how long or short to make it? Everybody has a different perspective of that as well. I try to do a variation of it. I try not to make some too long, but I try to have it to where a section like sometimes I do a day, probably not even a day. But if there's like a main focus, like what is the purpose of this chapter? Okay. And once I finish that chapter, I try to leave it off as a cliffhanger or cut it off. That way your reader will want to read the next chapter. Even if it's resolved on the first page, they will still read a little bit. So right. there's some chapters that's like two and then I have some that's 14 pages. I think it really oh. depends on what you want that chapter's focus to be on. Okay. And, and are you planning to stick in the same genre then or? I mostly plan on it. I do plan on doing like some standalone mysteries down the road, but okay. mysteries that that's, that's me. I like reading okay. fantasies and horror, but it's like, I can't write that. Right. Okay. Well, hey, everybody has their thing, right? Yes. Okay. So how do you go about marketing? And does, does any form of marketing seem to work for you better than others? I think it really depends on your genre because in the cozy world I've noticed a lot of people are like on the Facebook page they befriend like it's really a nice community and stuff I feel like yeah. you need to know where your genre's at I've heard like young adult authors they go a lot on TikTok that's where they advertise and they really reach out to people okay so I almost feel like you kind of need to know where your genre really is Right. But I think for the most part, definitely, I feel like for me, from what my experience, Goodreads just seems to be good. There's readers there, BookBub. Oh, there's two other ones. I can't think of the name of it. Right. Like, it's just book overall talk. general. Like, book Talk is another good one. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as much as you may try not to, do you ever write like one of your favorite authors? And if you are like in the middle of doing that, how do you stop yourself from doing so? Uh, 
I don't know if I really have in a way. Um, I will say this. I did use kind of going back to the outlines a little bit because I read one book by Miranda James and I loved it and his reviews were so good and I liked how he's there was always progress to the story and the murder the clues and the side plot I was like I need I've heard other authors do this they okay. use their outline so I went through his book and wrote a one sentence what happens in that chapter what is the main focus of that chapter and I made it's an actually outline a really good idea that really did help because it showed me like this clue was here and here you can see where the red herrings was what was why did he write that chapter and it really made sense and helped me push the story along versus like yeah like i said i wrote that same story three times already <laughs> right okay so. all right um do you believe in pen names and if so why um i do believe in pen names especially authors that write in different genres mm -hmm. um i do know in the cozy world there's a few people that write and um pen names i'm say Miranda James. It's actually yeah. a guy who's writing it. His, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, because he's women normally do write cozy mysteries, so he used the girl's name to get into. He figured that would help him sell more, or? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then well, there's some, I think publishers, too, will want different pen names, especially in the cozies. If you write cozy mysteries, you will see I think I saw one cozy mystery author. She has three different pen names, but she writes oh. in the same genre, but each of her book series is published by a different publisher. And it's just oh. to avoid competition, even though it's same author, same person. It's just a marketing That's purpose. That's pretty cool. Okay. Do you have a specific go-to person or group of people that you send your work to before publication? Um, the first person who reads my book is my husband. Okay. Um, he is he is very critical one. or is he easy on you, do you feel, because you're married to him? Or how does that work? No, he's honest. And I, that's what I like about it. But he's the one who's like, I know what you're saying, but that's not what it's coming across. Or he's like, you totally misspelled this word. I remember okay, I wrote okay. a short story in a group. I was trying to make it funny and lighthearted. And he's like, it sounds so gory. I'm like, this was, I'm like, oh my gosh, it does. So okay, he's always okay. like, I know what you mean, but that's not what's coming across. Um, and then I have like two other um, other author, like friend authors. They read my work and they do more of a critical thing. But my husband is the one who reads it first to tell me if it's worthy. Bad <laughs> or okay. Okay, um, what advice could you give to younger authors, rather, or, or even new authors? They don't have to be younger. Like People could start in their 50s, right? Yeah. What advice do you have to a new author of anything that you'd want to come off the top of your head that is a good way to start and a good way to figure out how to write in the right context? I say kind of read as much. Other than like the, the one I suggest earlier, there's two types of criticism. But right. definitely like read and kind of kind of enjoy your genre because you can kind of tell. I feel like in some writers, you can tell they really don't like the genre they are writing. OK. Because uh, when I very first started, I was writing fantasy. And okay. clearly I am not a fan because I've read some fantasy. But you're a fantasy books. fan, correct? Yes, I read some fantasy, but I can't write it. And I kind of learned. OK. Now, it doesn't have that tone, that vibe of it. Like the Witcher series, like, you know, you're in a fantasy world before you even get to Geralt. <laughs> and I cannot do that. And I can see okay. how I'm a mystery writer. I'm like, I don't have that tone. And it's fine. Okay. I say definitely, definitely read your favorite genre and just dive into it, enjoy it, and branch out. Try to learn as much as you can, really. Kind of see how they do it too. Like even with without adapting somebody else's yeah. style though. You want to create your own style, but learn the knowledge of how to write it. There's kind of a it's a fine line there. This is what I'm trying to help people learn. Yeah, because I feel like if like I don't know, like authors like not really stealing their work or anything like that, but you can see I had one author advice that I've heard. Write like a paragraph in your favorite book. 
and then use another author in their favorite book and you can kind of see their writing style like there's some that they write like ridiculously long sentences and other it's like short paragraphs right. and you can kind of you tell a tone what they use and you can see how you can develop your own voice by seeing how others do it or get an, right. a, an ideal how okay describe it just for the viewers like i said for for basically educational purposes describe your particular genre because you said it's not just mystery you're a sub genre of that okay. can you describe that sub genre and and what makes it important to you um, I like the cozy mystery world. It's lighthearted. It's like the opposite genre of horror. Okay. Like, like in a horror, like let's say Stephen King, you know, it's a bad town before you, your character gets to the bad town, and right. it's a bad town whenever the it it's resolved and it's ended. In okay. a cozy world, it's a good town, a happy town, kind of. The murder takes place, but at the end of the book, it's still a nice community, friends and family. And that they grow, okay. your characters grow with okay. that. And do you have more than one publication at this time, or is it just the the one book you have so far? Um, I have three, and I'm featured in three anthologies. But oh, this one, cool. The Binding Chance, is my debut, my stand, my book. All right, let's go into that. Let's describe what an anthology is. What is an anthology? Um, an anthology, basically, it's a group of writers that is in one novel. I have an example here, but okay. as one of them, and on the back, there is a nice list of how many. So is it like basically a group of short stories or, yes. or it's all conglomerated to make one story? No, it's a bunch of short stories and there's normally a theme to anthologies, all the one I've seen. This one, the theme is called Moving On and these authors take that prompt, that theme, and write however they want to with it. Okay. And there's what a different- like a chicken soup for the soul type thing. Would that be considered like an anthology type mm -hmm. deal? Yeah. Okay. This is fiction. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, but let's go with how do you know who to choose to go with your anthology? Do you, do you ever have a, an issue where like even with beta readers, right? Do you ever have an issue where you don't really know who to trust and how do you know who to send your work to before publication? Because I've had a lot of problems with this. That's an interesting question because I, before I got my publication, before I even wrote my anthology in those anthologies, mm -hmm. I was in a writer's group and I yeah. actually met some of my friends, my other beta readers in that writer's group. We just connected really well. Yeah. And that's, I don't, I feel bad. I don't have any you advice. Like that locally or? No, not locally. No, it's like a, um, there's a bunch of writers group online. The one that I was in, I'm still in it, but I'm not actively in it. It's hard yeah. to keep up, right? Um, oh, okay. It's called um, Deadlines for Writers. And every month they write a short story with the word count and then other writers will kind of critique it, give feedback, how you can improve as a writer. And okay. during that group, I found writer friends and we just connected really well and we just stayed in touch we read each other's work and that's pretty cool us out. All so right. i'm in writer's group but as far as like finding beta readers that does sound terrifying but i i know it i know it i've been there trust me and i it's hard to know who to trust too because you don't know whose opinion really works for your book because they might just hate that it might be a great book but they just don't like that type of writing so mm -hmm. there's what creates that dilemma there now, do you have any methods, right, that you could teach even me or like give us a little bit of knowledge here? Because what I'm trying to make this podcast for is to build a network, right? As opposed, it's like a video version of a group, mm -hmm. but yet it's a podcast. And obviously, I mean, it's, it's doing pretty well so far. The, the ratings are getting pretty high on YouTube. So that being said, do you have any ways that the viewers, which would be other authors mostly, could help get themselves reviews is there any way that you know that maybe we don't know about like hey i went on this website and actually i've been getting quite a few reviews from there do you have anything like that um a little bit um i think it kind of goes back to where your genre like the marketing thing like yeah. knowing where other writers are in those groups because i've actually met another author she was funny that we were published about the same time and okay. i actually reached out to her and 
we just kind of like chit chatted. We haven't read each other's work yet, um, but we just kind of just bonded. It's a kind of reach out to other people within your genre and finding groups because you don't have to be a huge social butterfly, but just enough. I feel like just yeah. to reach out to other people. Plus, it's kind of nice seeing other people who you work in your same genre. Yeah. It's also kind of nice to complain, too. Well, yeah. <laughs> that, and stuff. you can maybe get a different perspective on certain things in your genre as well, which would help. Yeah. And see also right. how they do it. And just, I don't know, I'm not saying we copy each other's work, but just see how they're marketing, too. It's like, that's a good idea. Like, yeah. I recently discovered one author on Instagram and that's like she does like these little mini videos it looks like she's talking to herself but it's really entertaining <laughs> it's really good so it's so kind of like her own little podcast type deal or something yeah she's like you she kind of like talks um parts in her story but the way she kind of does it it looks like it I don't know it's hard to describe it she does okay, it really I, good you have to yeah. see it apparently yeah okay I, think also kind of finding what you can do and what I'm trying to think of the word for it I'm just going to use the example that I can use because okay. my book series is a messy bookshop I have a few pictures of messy bookshops and have okay. like photographs in like the book world it's like what I guess kind of like your theme of your book or your genre just kind of explore with it and see what you can kind of do with it Right. And what would draw the people in, basically? Mm -hmm. What would catch somebody's eye that if you're looking for that type of genre? Mm -hmm. Right. OK. OK. If you could pick the brain of one author, either in your genre or any other genre, who would it be and why? Gosh, that's a tough question. Mm -hmm. uh, um, can they be living or dead? Doesn't matter. I'll have to go with an advocate to Christy then. She was, she really was, she's the, like, the founder, almost, of the Cozy Mystery World. I think she's nicknamed as the mother of Cozies. Oh, that's pretty Christine. cool. So, that would be kind of fun. Plus, a lot of her mysteries, even to this day, there's some I can't figure out. And it's just, really? it's fun, yeah. So, I do, like, cool. I would. But as a living person, I don't know. There's so many good. There's so many people, really right? Yeah, I, I usually get people with that question. It seems like. All right. Um, let's let's say you're 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 working on a sequel, right? Like there's a sequel yeah. to your book that you're working on now. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you go about? Now, this is this is a a tough question. How do you go about letting people know, right, from your first book? that there's a sequel without just leaving a cliffhanger at the end. Is there anything that you leave open? Is there any information that you kind of leave out hoping that they want to grasp onto? How do you go about doing that? Um, there's co cozy's one. They are, you are expected to write a series. I don't, I cannot think of a cozy. That's just a standalone. The start and finish. But, really? Yeah. They normally are a series, but okay. the answer you see, is I don't know much about the genre. So that's why I, no, that's fine. But to answer, like, overall, like, outside of the cozy world, I would do um, a short-term problem that will get resolved in that book and a long-term problem that will take a few books to answer that. That okay. way the short problem can drive the story. And I don't want to say have the long-term problem as a back, on the back burner. A back but burner. But something that will right. push your character want something but it can't be resolved in the first one. I okay. think the okay. best way to kind of answer that, like the best example I can think of at the moment is there's a murder that happens in cozies, which normally that is what happens. Yeah. But a cozy, like the main character meets a friend or a love interest and he's his wife or spouse is suspected of murder of his wife. But that won't get resolved in the first one, but it will get resolved over time to figure out what happened to his wife before she really is interested in this guy or not. Okay. That's a good, like, long-term problem in the, you know, mystery murder world. All right, let's dig into your main character situation. Now I got a good one for you. All Do right, you right. consider killing off a main character, like, in your first book for any, for any apparent reason? And if you would, why? 
Uh, I feel bad for this question in a way, because in the cozy world, you can't do that. No? No, I'm, I'm asking for a one star if I kill off a main character. Um, Ooh, okay. So how many times? Because in other genres, that can that can work yeah. because the team that they worked with would carry on, and they mm -hmm. would. This would be the the explanation of the aftermath. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do like it, like non cozy, because I do read like other mysteries, fantasies, and stuff. I do. Yeah. I don't mind a char a main character being killed off. I mean, it's definitely a shocker, especially where you place it. In the story, I think that's also where it matters. And of course, how does that affect your other characters in the story as well? Okay. And kind of push through with it. But I can't do that in the cozy world. But in other like mysteries and other genres, as long as you have a good reason and show how it affects everybody, I say, right. say go for it. <laughs> All right. So the name of your book is called The Binding Chance. How did you come to that? And what is what's the what's the actual definition of what that means to you? Um, it's based off of a fighting chance. Cozy mysteries, we have fun punts in the stories. Awesome. Um, I think the a few that I can think of is like meet your baker instead of meet your maker. Instead of meet your maker. Okay. Yeah. Um let's see. There's okay, a, so, so there would yeah. be that's your analogy to how you made yeah. that. Yeah, okay. and the book, That's cool. it's, and a fighting chance, because the, the main character is trying to solve the murder to save the bookstore and keep her boss out of jail, so it's a fighting chance, so I kind of, you know, played around with it. Right, okay, all right. Um, do you see writing as a therapeutic or spiritual thing? And if you do, how so? How does it make you feel? How does it help you as a person? How does it, how do you generate ideas um i enjoy writing i say it's probably more of a therapy kind of thing especially when you're having a bad day you plan on killing somebody i mean you can't do that in real life <laughs> oh right yeah uh, um it's better than murder i guess right there you go. i've seen i actually seen t-shirts that say that you know i write because you know it's better than murder or i i drink coffee because it's better than murdering somebody you know so, all right that makes sense. It makes sense. Do you think it's credible to switch between being like a fiction author, such as ourselves or whomever, and then switch to something that's nonfiction, like like writing a book about like something in the medical field or something that really happened? Do you do you think that other people would see that author as credible or not really because they're used to just writing fake stuff? I say it's kind of credible, especially if you have a lot of experience with okay. that. I would kind of think so. Honestly, I almost feel like they might be a better writer. I've no one author. I cannot think of his name. I can think of his book titles, but he okay. was a lawyer before he started writing fiction. A and, lawyer, you said? Yeah, he was a lawyer before he started writing books. Oh, that's pretty cool. And you can kind of see that. So honestly, I feel like what your profession is, or if you have a degree in something, I say you can really bring it out. Right. Well, people have actually seem to have different perspectives on that because I don't know if you've watched any of the previous shows before I've had you on here, but I've had that conversation with people and people seem to, like I said, have different perspectives. Some people are like, mm, man, you know, if you're telling me all these fake stories and stuff, you ain't going to come tell me some something that's real. I'm like, oh, yeah, that dude, I'll tell you right now, that, that dude's right right there, you know? So there's some that, like some I could kind of be wary of. Right. Yeah, but of course. Like obviously, if someone writes I had to be a killer and they're writing cozies, you know, I'm like, <laughs> OK, I'm second no. guess. Them. <laughs> Makes sense. All right. Do you think it's OK to go back in time and in present time in the same chapter or even in the same book? And if so, why? Um, I kind of like both ways. I kind of, I don't know. This is a, I guess I'm a little biased. I like the journal entries. Um, I've read one. What do you mean by that? Kind of like they are like a present day, like the main character in the story is reading a journal. And instead of like reading a journal, they will go back in time. And as if you're reading a journal as in real. So Oh, I do that's kind of cool. like it. I like the that's time. A, that's another another way to tell the history. Yes. They're reading the journal of the history. 
Yes. Perfect. That makes perfect sense. It's actually pretty cool. What risks have you taken with your writing that you think have paid off or have you not taken any yet? <laughs> I uh, I have I've probably avoided some risks. I've submitted to vanity presses without realizing, which I never did pay them. And you said um, a vanity press? Yes. And what does that mean? Um, a vanity press, basically they want you to pay for them to publish your books. I know there's an author earlier that you interview. I can picture her. I cannot remember her name, but she did pay. I think she said she paid like $10,000 altogether for her oh, that two would be books. Lee. Lee. I think that was Lee Titler. Yes. Pretty sure it was Lee. Yeah. So yes. that's what a vanity press is. They want you I remember to that, right? Yes. I, I, like, I remember I my conversations with people. But that's basically what they want, and okay. I avoid that because one, I didn't have that money, and two, it seemed to kind of weird. Um, but as far as like other, their, probably other risk is really just putting yourself out there. I submitted to a bunch of agents and asked other people to read it because I don't know. I have, as far as major risk, I really haven't. All right. Okay. I avoided them. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Tell me some some really essential characteristics to one of your main characters in your in your genre like how do you how do you go about writing them what what descriptive analytics do they have that other characters in other genres may not um this is probably the hardest one for me to write it's a likable character because okay. obviously you're right but still may be the protagonist still may be the killer or something say what the, the, so they still could be the killer, but you have to make people like them. Is that what you're saying? Oh, no. They kind of, You want your readers to like the character enough that they want to keep reading the series. All right. Okay. So that's kind of hard is to make sure a broad people like it and not just a handful or a small group of people that like it. Okay. So I kind of say that's it's pretty hard. Okay. But as far as how I make them likable is make sure they are doing something active that kind of pushes the story and be brave and this is kind of weird <laughs> what would never happen to my character yeah because some things is like i don't i'll be petrified to go ah, i actually like that idea people. that's a different idea that i've seen brought to the table than anything else thus far so that's actually pretty cool i like that Okay, um, what are some good authors that you think either young authors or new authors should read to try to just get a grasp on like, not like, oh, I'm going to write just like them, but just to get a grasp on how to write and, and how to make it sound contextual and correct? Hmm, I'm trying to think of a few. Kind of trying to think of some that's in the mystery world, not just cozies. So I think okay. Yeah. Um, goodness, man, I'm like the worst person. I can picture books, but I cannot <laughs> think of them. Um, Harlan Coben, Coben, goodness gracious, he's like a big mystery thriller. He's got When Out, Promise Me. Um, Promise Me, I've heard of. Yes, he's he's okay. pretty good in the mystery world. Let me think. Well, it doesn't have to be in mystery. Like any other authors you think people should read that like, hey, check check out this, check out this, just to maybe kind of get a touch of it, a little bit different of a feel. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to say some of my favorite. You said authors. Agatha Christie. That would obviously yes. be one of them. Yeah, she was really good. I feel like as in that I've world. I've never read anything Agatha Christie in my life, actually. Now I'm going to have to, I guess. And let's see. And then there were none. That was a really good one. The Death on the Nile River. That was recently turned into a movie. That was pretty good, too. That's pretty cool. I didn't get, honestly, out of all the Agatha Christie's I've read, I've never guessed who done it, how they done it. It's, <laughs> oh, wow. I've kind of given up on trying to solve some of them. Some of them I have in other authors, but hers well, is that like, would that, that makes a good author then, right? I mean, yes. she did what she set out to do. Yes, which is a, Fool you, but at the end of the story, it all makes sense. Right. Okay. She does get her red, red herrings and make them believable. Okay. 
All right. Well, it seems like we had a we had a great podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Um, I will have you back if you you want to come back. Maybe after your next book comes out, you could show your book. Actually, you want to show the people your book one more time just so they can see yeah. and actually tell everybody where to find it as well. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Where can we find this? Uh, you can find it mostly. Honestly, Amazon is cheaper. I'm just gonna be honest. <laughs> um, but. <laughs> Um, you okay. can find Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, I believe Kobo. I know there's a few other ones. Those are the main ones I can think of on the top of my head, though. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your time today, Jessica. I'll have this spun down. I'll send it over to you as fast as possible. Oh, you're fine. Thanks for having me. I appreciate right. it. Absolutely. Have a good night. You too. Bye.